Hi folks. We are going to start talking about uh, different types of chemical bonding, how we name compounds, and how we write correct formulas for chemical compounds. So the first thing we need to have is a definition for a chemical bond. A chemical bond is an attractive force between the nuclei and the valence electrons of different atoms. And then that attractive horse force holds or binds those atoms together. Atoms bond in order to decrease their potential energy and increase their stability. The decrease potential energy and increase stability. So when atoms bond, their valence electrons get redistributed to make the atoms more stable. There are different kinds of bonds, and so atoms achieve this redistribution in different ways. So the first kind of bonding we're going to talk about is ionic bonding. Ionic bonding is when electrons are actually transferred from one atom to another. And when that happens, one atom loses electrons and is therefore left with a positive charge. We call that a cation. And the other atom gains electrons, so it has a negative charge and is an anion. And then these opposite charges attract each other. And so you don't just have one atom uh, uh, with a... Uh, you don't, you don't just have one of each type of atom. You have many, many millions of each type of atom. And then they gather together in a conglomerate here that we call an ionic lattice, lattice structure. Covalent bonding is another type of bonding. And in covalent bonding, electron pairs are shared between atoms. So... We have two atoms and they just come together and they just share atoms between them. So atom C would be uh, a sphere, atom D would be a sphere, and then they just kind of overlap in this region with their shared electrons. So how do you know if a bond is going to be ionic or if it's going to be covalent? In reality, many bonds are neither truly 100% ionic nor truly 100% covalent. There are, there's a whole category of um, molecules that are in between. And, and so most bonds do have this blend of ionic and covalent characteristics. So it's this spectrum, as you see here in the chart. And what determines where a molecule falls on this chart is the difference in electronegativity, electronegativity of the atoms. We talked about electronegativity um, previously, but just as a quick reminder, electronegativity um, increases as you move up and to the right on the periodic table but you don't include the noble gases. So fluorine is the most electronegative element on the periodic table. Now this is actually a table of electronegativity values and fluorine has the highest numeric value here for electronegativity. You can see that oxygen and chlorine and nitrogen are also very high, but the further we move away from fluorine, the lower the values get until we're all the way here to 0 0.7 for, for francium. So we can tell if we have an ionic bond, if there is a very big difference in electronegativity. If we look at those values on the previous periodic table and there's a difference in electronegativity values of more than 1.7, then you know you've got an ionic bond. This typically happens between metals and nonmetals because nonmetals are over here with their very high electronegativity values and metals are over here with their very low electronegativity values. So this is where you get the biggest difference in electronegativity. Polar covalent bonds are in between ionic bonds and um, purely covalent bonds. And they have a medium difference in electronegativity. Um, somewhere between 0 0.3 and 1.7 uh, on that from the numbers on the previous uh, page. So 
This tends to happen when you have two different nonmetals or a nonmetal bonding to a metalloid. That's when you tend to find polar covalent bonds. You get purely covalent bonds where the atoms are sharing electrons equally. You get that when there's a very small or zero difference in electronegativity, so somewhere in the range of z 0 to 0 0.3. And that pretty much happens, um, well, it happens most commonly when you have two atoms of the same nonmetal. For instance, oxygen gas is made up of two atoms of oxygen bonded together. Okay, let's look at each of these three types of bond in a little bit more detail. With the ionic bond, the metal is less electronegative, so it gives up electrons to form a cation. And then the nonmetal is more electronegative. It gains electrons to form this anion. So we've got the metal and we've got the nonmetal here. And you can see that the electron clouds are completely separate. This atom has a positive charge now, this atom has a negative charge now, and they are attracted to each other because of an electrostatic attraction, uh, um, opposite charges attract. In a polar covalent bond, it's a covalent bond, so electrons are shared, but because it's polar, that means that electrons are shared unequally. Another way to say that is that there's asymmetric electron density. There are more electrons hanging out over here than there are over here. It's like an unequal tug of war for electrons. This results in partial charges, partial charges, not full ions, not a full charge of positive one or negative one, um, but partial charges. And we represent those partial charges with this lowercase Greek letter delta. Um, partial positive charge on this end, partial negative charge on this end. Remember, electrons have a negative charge, so the negative end of the atom, uh, of, of the molecule, is where there are more electrons. The next kind of covalent bond we have to talk about is the purely covalent bond, the nonpolar covalent bond, where electrons are shared and they are shared equally. Um, notice that here our electron density is symmetric. We have um, electrons spending an equal amount of time on this half of the molecule as they are on this half of the molecule. And we usually see this when we have two atoms of the same element bonding together. This is most common with the diatomic elements. There are seven diatomic elements, and you do need to memorize these seven diatomic elements. Hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. Okay, so let's put this into practice and actually look at some examples. Sodium chloride, um, hydrogen chloride, and chlorine. When we compare the electronegativities of sodium and chlorine um, from the periodic table a few slides back, sodium has a, I'm sorry, chlorine has a value of 3, sodium has a value of 0.9, and when you do the subtraction, you get a difference of 2.1. So this is definitely an ionic compound, greater than that 1.7 value. If we have hydrogen chloride, chloride has an electronegativity of 3.0, hydrogen has a value of 2.1, so the difference here is 0 0.9. That's less than the 1.7 that we need to be ionic, but it's not the, um, so you need greater than 1.7 for ionic, and you need less than 0 0.3 to be purely covalent, nonpolar covalent. And we're in between these values, so this is going to be a polar covalent molecule. Lastly, chlorine gas, um, 3 is the electronegativity value for chlorine, 3 minus 3 is 0, so there is no difference in electronegativity here. This is a nonpolar covalent molecule. So we have ionic compounds and we have covalent compounds, but there are different kinds of covalent compounds. Some are 
purely covalent compounds and some are a little bit more like ionic compounds because they're lopsided with their electrons and we call those polar. Okay, normally I won't give you electronegativity values. So you just have to base your ideas off of the periodic table and where the elements are on the periodic table. So here are some compounds where you should predict, do you think that these compounds would be ionically bonded, covalently bonded, or, um, and if they're covalently bonded, are they polar covalent or nonpolar covalent? So pause the video and give it a try. And because oxygen gas, O2, is made up of two atoms of the same element, there's no difference in electronegativity, and this is nonpolar. Because potassium fluoride has a metal and a nonmetal at totally different sides of, of the periodic table, those will have very different electronegativities, and that will be an ionic compound. Hydrogen iodide, these are both nonmetals, both nonmetals. So this will be a covalent compound, but they're different nonmetals. So this will be a polar covalent molecule. Magnesium oxide, we have a metal and a nonmetal. They're not as far apart as potassium and fluoride were, but they're still pretty far apart. So this is going to be an ionic compound. Carbon monoxide, these are right next to each other on the periodic table. They're both nonmetals. Um, and so this is a covalent compound. And since the atoms are different, this will be a polar covalent compound. Aluminum phosphide. Aluminum and phosphorus are very close together on the periodic table. We do have a metal and a nonmetal, but they are quite close to each other. So they are not very different in electronegativity. This would actually categorize as a polar covalent um, molecule. And then we have nitrogen gas, two atoms of the same element bonded together. It's, it's a nonmetal. So this is a covalent compound and this is nonpolar covalent. And I just realized that I should have written the word covalent up here. There is one more type of bonding that we haven't discussed yet. And because we talked about metal joining with a nonmetal, we talked about two nonmetals joining together, but we didn't talk about two metals joining together. And we do have um, a kind of bonding associated with that. It's called metallic bonding. It happens between metal atoms, unsurprisingly. And in metallic bonding, what you have are delocalized electrons. These delocalized electrons are free to move among all the atoms. And so uh, chemists often refer to this as being a sea of electrons. Okay, so these electrons are free to move. We call it a sea of electrons. And this sea of electrons um, gives metal a lot of the properties that we associate with metals, like the ability to conduct electricity. Um, comes from these electrons that are free to move. So how can we summarize the three types of bonding that we've learned about? Now, in reality, we kind of learned about four types of bonding because for covalent, we learned about um, polar covalent and we learned about nonpolar covalent. Um, and we'll look more at those two types of covalent bonding later. Um, but here, just the three main types of bonding, ionic versus covalent versus metallic, here are kind of some similarities and some differences between them to help you uh, be able to judge whether a compound being described is a metal, a, uh, a metallically bonded uh, substance, an ionically bonded substance, or a covalently bonded substance. So some of the key things here to look at, first of all, Look at what types of atoms are involved. Ionic compounds are between a metal and a nonmetal, but covalent is between two nonmetals, and metallic bonding would be between two metals or two metal atoms.
the electron behavior, what happens in ionic bonding? Electrons are actually transferred from the metal to the nonmetal. Whereas in covalent bonding, electrons are shared, shared between two nonmetals. And metallic bonding is different. Again, we have delocalized electrons that are free to move back and forth every which way um, between metal atoms. The structure is different. We have a crystal lattice structure versus individual true molecules um, versus a sea of electrons. The chemical formula, um, we call this chemical formula a formula unit as opposed to a molecular formula. We use slightly different terminology when we describe this sort of formula versus this sort of formula. We have um, different physical states. So if you have a solid, it could be an ionic compound or a metallic compound. Now it could also be covalent because there are covalent solids as well. Um, but if you have a liquid or a gas, you almost certainly have a covalent molecule. And that's because the melting points of ionic compounds are very high, so it takes a lot of energy to get them um, to the point where they actually melt. Um, metallic compounds have a very high melting point, even higher than ionic, but covalent compounds have a low melting point. Are they soluble in water? Um, ionic compounds are often soluble in water. Covalent compounds, it depends on their polarity. Polar um, molecules are soluble in water, but nonpolar are not. Metals are not soluble in water. Lastly, electrical conductivity. Ionic compounds, or actually at first I should tell you that in order to conduct electricity, a substance needs charged particles that are free to move. Charged particles that are free to move. Now, ionic substances have charged particles. But when they're solids, they're stuck in this crystal lattice structure and they are not free to move. So ionic substances, when they're solids, have charged particles, but they are not free to move. When we melt the ionic substance or dissolve it in water, then we disrupt the crystal lattice and those charged particles are free to move. So ionic compounds do conduct electricity when they um, are molten or when they are dissolved in water. Covalent substances do not conduct electricity. And metals do conduct electricity whether they are solids or whether they are melted, if they are molten. So you can see here that electro, uh, electrical conductivity really varies between ionic, covalent, and metallic um, substances. And that can be a good uh, rule to use to help you judge if you've got a mystery substance, is it ionic, is it covalent, is it metallic? Um, physical state, if you've got a gas or a liquid, then you are probably dealing with a covalent substance. The only metal at room temperature that is a liquid is mercury. Um, yes, so those are the properties that can help you identify what sort of substance you're dealing with. I hope this helps.